You're listening to Travel Nursing and Allied Life, hosted by Travel. Hey, nomads! Welcome to another episode of Travel Nursing and Allied Life. I am your host today, Dylan Callier, traveling physical therapist. Um, and you might recognize me from the New Medical Nomads podcast, but today is another speaker series. I am going to be talking about my session, um, this upcoming TravCon, TravCon 2023, September 17th through the 20th. If you haven't got your tickets already, please do so. Um, it's my favorite event of the year, and I'm very excited to be speaking again. And this year is um, something that I am very passionate about, which is science, but the title is Trust Me, I'm Lying, The Problems facing science and healthcare. I'm very uh, proud of that title. But um, we're going to be diving into some of the issues facing um, science and literature um, and research studies in healthcare itself. So please join me for that. Um, I'm hoping to make it very interactive and very fun. I know um, that topic might not be um, kind of the top of the list on a lot of people, but I'm hoping to kind of give you my big takeaways um, and why this is uh, kind of worth a session going to. But um, the big, a big question I got when I was submitting this was a lot of us are following physician orders, maybe not so much on the therapy side of things like myself. Um, We're typically pretty autonomous with um, how often we see patients, what um, kind of treatments they're getting, um, et cetera. But if you're more in a hospital setting, you're more kind of following physician's orders and um, physicians and uh, PAs and MPs tend to take more of that decision-making process, and then others down the chain um, tend to be the actual ones delivering that care. Um, and so the big question was, why Why was this um, a pertinent matter for those who are on the um, more delivering care side of things? And my big um, push for this is that the more that we can understand um, what matters and maybe what um, what we should prioritize um, with patients will help us become better clinicians. Um, specifically, I'm thinking around the topic of like education. Um, so some, for an example, um, maybe if you are in the um, post hip replacement um, side of things, um, knowing that hip replacements tend to pop out um, after surgery around 1% of the time. Um, and if they don't receive any uh, post-surgical hip precautions, that number goes up to maybe 1.4%. Um, and so that's an interesting number to know. And then you look closer at the data and you find out most of those are actually related to falls. So maybe um, instead of so much education around the post-surgical hip precautions, we are more looking at fall education, making sure they're not wearing flip-flops around the house after surgery, uh, making sure they understand that they are need to take it slow in the mornings because they're on um, medications that might influence their blood pressure. Um, maybe they're on pain medications. Maybe now they are um, on a medication that uh, makes them go to the bathroom more so they're more urgent and they're trying to get to the bathroom faster. And so maybe that education looks more along the lines of uh, fall education than it actually does with uh post hip precautions and allows you to kind of tailor your your experience with each patient. Um, now another big one is we're finding out that ice um, tends to delay healing for a lot of low um, low injury like sprained ankles, um, low acuity injuries. Um, so if patients aren't necessarily wanting to ice, um, it's really more for pain now than actually like helping the healing process. It actually delays the healing process is what figuring that out. Um, if you have those orders, uh, you can tell a patient, hey, do what you want. Um, it's really for pain. If you're able to get through it without ice, totally fine. It's kind of there to to use um, in order for you to um, get through your day a little easier. And so knowing these types of things um, will really help you and your patients uh, moving forward. And it's just interesting to know. Um, we're always finding new things or we're always discovering that old things weren't quite correct. Um, and so the, the, that I would say that that would be the big, big reason going into this on why all clinicians should, should know, um, a little bit about research. And then my two big key takeaways that I'm hoping that, um, people get from going to the session, um, is really just kind of how to recognize, uh, quote unquote, bad studies. 
Um, and this can be in science, but this is also very much like pretty much anything that you see promoted um, on, on you know, Google or ads or whatever. Um, a lot of these issues are also in like finances. A lot of these issues um, can be found in other areas other than just healthcare. So if you um, get good at recognizing bad information, um, it'll help you across the board, not just with healthcare. Um, and you don't have to be a statistics wizard to recognize bad, bad information. So um, in a past life, coming out of grad school, I was very much on the research path. Um, we had a team that had a research project and went very, very well. Um, we ended up being um, published in the JOSPT uh, magazine in 2017, which is kind of the top tier uh, magazine for physical therapy. And um, I was lovingly known as the stats guy. So I worked very closely with a um, Washington of uh, Washington University of St. Louis uh, statistician. We um, did a lot of work on this. And then for our kind of our big end climax um, presentation for our uh, doctorates, we all five of us delivered a presentation and then we stand up on the stage about for 10 to 20 minutes and we just get grilled on um, on the presentation. And if you're an outsider looking in on that, a lot of those questions were around stats. And so I was answering roughly about 50% of those questions because I was most familiar with the numbers. But that really doesn't, um, the, the stats part, it, it's a it's a component, but there's so much more going on um, for you to recognize if if a study is bad um, versus just knowing the math. Um, and I would say math is kind of like pretty low tier. Um, there are some some big things to know, but um, overall, like you don't have to be a math whiz, you don't have to be a stat whiz in order to recognize if information is bad um, with a study. Um, and then some examples of this would be looking at a study and then are they claiming what they are measuring? Are they actually measuring that or can it actually be measured? Um, so my, uh, <laughs> how I explain this is um, if anybody remembers the It Works, it was kind of like a seaweed wrap um, that goes around the midsection for people that wanted to lose weight. And this was probably popular around like I don't know, mid, mid 2000s, maybe a little bit later, closer to, um, you know, maybe 2012, something like that. Um, and a lot of what they were claiming were, were, were items that couldn't necessarily be measured. So you'd put this wrap on, they're saying, oh, it helps lose weight because it reduces your inflammation or it decreases appetite or um, it improves your gut health. Um, it removes toxins from the body and all of those types of claims you can find in generally every single like weight loss product out there and um, a lot of those can't be effectively measured and so if we take that it works test and apply it to a lot of these um, healthcare studies sometimes what they're claiming to measure is not actually being able to be measured um, or sometimes they are claiming um, they're measuring one thing and then you look at it, it's actually just a survey of um, not even the patients, maybe the family members. Um, and it's not a, an effective way of measuring, measuring that um, item. So that's a big thing is looking at can they actually measure what they're claiming that they are measuring. And that's usually the big outcome at the end. And then another example of this would be what we call A versus A plus B studies. And this looks at the whole concept of placebo. And there, many people think of placebo as this like pill that you get, and that's like a sugar pill. And um, you take it and you get this placebo effect. Well, placebo effects happen with any type of intervention. Um, it's not only the shams, but there, the, also what we deliver in healthcare has placebo around it. Um, a good example of this is um, they had a big UK study maybe 10 years ago that looked at meniscus debriding and compared it to a sham surgery where they just went in 
and kind of flushed the knee out and then came back out. And so they compared these two different surgeries. One was addressing the meniscus that was thought to be the problem. And then the other one was literally just flushing it with IV um, fluid and then sewing it back up. So that was the sham study. And what they found is that there was zero, um, zero difference in recovery. And even though patients received a surgery, those surgeries have their own placebo effects. And so oftentimes those patients felt better after surgery than before, even though they had zero um, mechanical changes. And that was a kind of a big breakthrough study and you don't really see a lot of scopes, knee scopes anymore because of that study and because it was so well done. Um, so anytime you see a study where it's like, oh, um, let's say patient, uh, patient had a shoulder injury, went through surgery, went through the normal process of things. And then you have this over here and it was patient went, um, had a shoulder injury, um, went through surgery, went through the normal process of things and received this uh, vitamin B12. So anytime you have an and and you're comparing the two, the placebo effect of whatever you added is always going to have that group a little bit higher than the other. So knowing that we can really devalue a lot of those studies when it's an A, like they received physical therapy or um, they received one-on-one um, -on -one sit time with nurses. And then we look at kind of what they're adding in addition to that. So A versus A plus B studies tend to be lower on the, on the chain of showing something's effectiveness just because we know that, oh, placebo is always gonna be a part of this. And then finally, a big t key takeaway is learning the business of research. So you, as a researcher, your biggest thing is um, not necessarily put out research, but it's to get published. And so you start playing to the rules of what it takes in order to get published. And knowing that it, in order to publish something, it has to be interesting, it has to be new, um, and usually you're showing positive effects of something. So um, let's go back to the A versus A plus B study. If I'm producing a study and I'm saying, oh, um, back pain of physical therapy is what we usually give people, and then we're gonna give people um, physical therapy with back pain plus a nutritious peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, something like that would probably get headlines of, hey, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches helps improve um, pain and strength outcomes in people with back pain. Um, and that placebo is gonna raise it a little bit more, but it's gonna be a positive effect and um, it's kind of interesting. So most likely it's gonna get the okay to go ahead and be, be published. Um, when it comes to studies, studies that show no effects or no difference um, should be held with more weight because of the business, things that don't show any effect um, typically don't get published. Um, and so when a no effect finally does come through, one, it has to be really good. Um, and two, those kind of show us more information because the stats tend to allow for a little bit more um, positives, to like a positive effect to sneak through um, than a negative effect. So usually when a negative effect comes through, we know for sure it's a negative effect. And um, that's why they're a little bit more interesting and that saves us time with um, what we're trying to do with patients. Does this actually improve their outcomes? Does this actually improve um, their strength, their time in the hospital, whatever you're trying to effectively measure. Um, those null effects should be held with a higher um, degree of importance than those studies that show a positive effect because there are so few studies out there with a null effect. But that is um, my two big key takeaways that I'm hoping to explain to everybody. Um, and I'll be going through a lot of um, interesting scenarios and some um, some fun fun ways to understand uh, some of these different co concepts. I'm hoping to make this pretty fun. And um, yeah, please join me. Again, this, trust me, I'm lying. The problems facing science and healthcare. This year, TravCon 2023, September 17th through the 20th. And I'll see you there. Thanks for listening to Travel Nursing and Allied Life. You can find the full show notes below or at travcon.org. 
please help us out by rating our podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. 